group. Um, I'm just going to talk a bit about the Care Pathways and Outcome Study, which is a multidisciplinary study um, in Queens that we have done for, the, for quite, quite a while now, but I came into the study on the third phase, and that's what I'm going to talk. We are on the fourth phase of the study, um, but we, are, um, we just started, so we don't have any, any data um, at the minute from the fourth phase, so I'm going to talk about the third phase and what we found. I hope it's of any use to any of you. Um, so, um, so yeah, this is about the Care Pathways and Outcome Study, which um, is uh, located in Queens, in, in the school that um, uh, Dominic said. And uh, initially it was funded by the HSC, um, uh, the Public Health Agency for the phases uh, one, two, and three, and now it's being uh, funded by the ESRC. Uh, what is it about? This, this is a longitudinal study that um, for, uh, has been following this population of children who were under five years old and care in Northern Ireland on 31st March, on the 31st of March 2000, and these were 374 children. Um, and we've been trying to find out uh, the placement patterns for them and exploring uh, whether um, type of placement matters, whether, um, whether if children go into foster care or adoption or kinship care um, or residence, whether, whether it matters in different outcomes and how they are doing in different aspects of their lives and how. Um, so this is basically the key question. So um, in the phase three of the study, it was uh, Dominic, myself, Kelly, and, and Greg um, uh, were part of the research team. And um, what we did is, um, well, I'm going to talk first a bit about the first two previous phases. F the first phase was um, profiling this population of children. Uh, and the second phase, we interviewed, they interviewed um, uh, parents and carers, uh, foster carers, adoptive parents and birth parents of the children. And um, in this third phase when I came in, uh, which was called the children's perspective, we actually interviewed the children themselves at that age because they were between 9 and 14 and we thought it was a good age to start talking to them and engaging them in the research. Um, but we also interviewed their parents and carers. Um, those were 77 children, and we, uh, we tried to represent the different uh, pathways, the different placement types. So um, most of them, most of these 374 children had gone to be adopted, but we tried to interview um, similar uh, proportion, proportion of children in the different placements. So we interviewed 18 uh, adopted children, 19 long-term stable, um, that they were in, in long-term stable foster care, uh, 13 were in kinship care, 15 were um, subject to residence order, and 12 were back living with their birth parents. Um, so you can see for the profile here, these were long-term placements, and um, most of the children had gone uh, to live with their carers, their parents and carers at a relatively young age, although those who were adopted uh, went into their placement um, a bit younger than in other placements, um, the same with the residence order. Um, so, no. I'm going to just talk a bit about of, uh, different findings. Um, first, uh, in terms of placement stability, attachment, uh, self-esteem and happiness, health and behavior, education, parenting stress, contact, family communication, social service involvement, and social support. These are the different topics I'm going to talk about today. Um, so between, this is a, a graph of the percentage of children that achieved stability between uh, 2002 and 2007, because we uh, profiled the placement of the children at different stages in 2000, 2002, 2004, and 2007. So um, as you can see, um, uh, most 
most placement have, have been stable, um, although um, it's a bit less for foster care, but 87% is still quite a high number. Um, high proportion. Then in terms of attachment, we used um, we used a measure called the uh, inventory of parent and peer attachment and it was the revised version for children. Um, we found that in general, um, regardless of placement type, children were um, uh, attached to their parents and carers. Um, only, only a very small proportion, uh, one child in adoption, uh, two in resident children and no, three in resident children and two birth parents um, that were living in birth parents had a low attachment um, score, but the majority were securely attached. And that was even more. We, we also measured peer attachment, and we found that the, the children at that stage seemed to be more securely attached to their parents than to their peers. Um, then, in terms of children's self-esteem and happiness, we used a measure called the Pierce Harris Self-Concept Scale. And again, regardless of placement type, most children were had um, a good self-concept of, you know, they had uh, high, high levels of self-esteem, basically. Um, although, um, although you can see that kidship care, for example, the children in kidship care seem to have higher, higher self-concept than um, others like particularly the, those uh, in the resident order um, group. But in general, most children were happy um, in themselves. Um, then um, we also used the strengths and difficulties questionnaire, which you probably most of you know uh, about it, um, which measures um, basically behavioral difficulties on children. Um, what we found here is, the, is you can see differences um, now in the different um, in the different placement groups. Um, you can see that um, children who are either in foster care or living with birth parents tended to have tended to be more likely to have um, difficulties and in terms of behavior compared to other children in the different placement types um, and, uh, and compared to the general population which only is 10%. Um, so even, even the adopted group um, seems quite high, um, you know, considering, especially if you divide adoption between those who are adopted by um, stranger, um, by stranger, those who are adopted by stranger and those who are adopted by foster, foster carers, um, especially those that were adopted by foster carers tend to have more difficulties. We'll see that in this other slide. Um, we found that, um, oh, and, oh, and also most of the children who, who tended to score high in the FDQ, um, their parents told us that they had been diagnosed with um, things like ADHD or, you know, different conditions. Um, then um, we also asked the parents about the children's um, health um, when we interviewed them in a qualitative, in a semi-structure interview, and um, they identified the they identified different health problems, especially cognitive and behavioral problems, and um, you can see how there's a high proportion of children who are adopted who had who, appeared, who according to their parents and their parents they had. Um, they, they were they had serious health problems, um, 11 out of 18, and that's seven. Uh, seven out of these 11 were adopted by previous foster carers. Um, also, you can see um, high proportions for those who are living with birth parents um, on residential and foster care. Um, <coughs> As I said, 
said children had a range of conditions, these were mostly cognitive and behavioral, um, but these were quite prevalent in the adoption group. Um, for example, out of the eight diagnoses of fetal alcohol syndrome that were um, that, that, that par parents and carers told us that the children had, out of these eight, five um, of these were in the adult, were adopted children. Um, how, like the, the majority of uh, parents and carers believe that the child's behavior had stayed the same or improved and also, you know, in contrast with these kind of very uh, negative kind of results, in contrast of that, many parents and carers also highlighted the strengths of their children and positive behaviors and when we asked the children themselves, many of them um, most of them thought that their health was okay or, or good or brilliant. Um, and there was not that much difference between uh, placements. So it's quite, it's quite a complex set of data we had um, in terms of like different ways that we collected the data, different perspectives. In terms of children's education, we used uh, the British Picture Vocabulary Scale which is a measure of um, a scholastic aptitude, basically is looking at the children's vocabulary. Um, we found that the majority of children um, had poor scores, um, especially those, in, especially those um, who are living with birth parents, 78% of them um, scored low on that measure, and then there were 50% of those in foster care and 50% of those in kinship care, um, then that's compared to 25% of the general population. Um, so even though we saw there that um, uh, children who are living with their birth parents had some difficulties at school in terms of academically, we also found that um, they actually were the ones that um, were less likely to receive uh, additional supports um, despite needing them the most. Um, in contrast, the majority, the majority of children adopted by previous foster carers and nearly half of those in foster care actually were receiving some support at school. Um, despite the their difficulties, um, the majority of parents and carers believe that children were coping, coping very well or all right at school, um, you know, considering the limitations that, that they faced. Um, however, a few identified problems like bullying and behavioral problems at school, um, that, that didn't really depend on placement type. Um, a few children appeared to do very well at school and had passed the 11 plus test. But um, we have like a few examples of um, teachers having really low expectations um, for, um, and social services about the children and having difficulties to even try to get the children to sit the exam. Um, in terms of parenting stress, these results you can see mirror quite a bit the ones from the strengths and difficulties questionnaire. Um, so um, most uh, you know, uh, half of the birth parents and uh, nearly half of uh, foster carers um, actually scored high in terms of parenting stress. Um, so it's, you can see that the proportions here and they are quite similar to the strengths and difficulties questionnaire. So there, there probably is a relationship there um, between, you know, the stress that the parents and carers faced and the difficulties that they perceived the children had in terms of behavior. In, the, in terms of behavior. Um, this, is, this graph, it, it's the contact with birth family, but it's face-to-face uh, -face contact. It reflects face-to-face -face contact. So you can see that um, there was, I think it was like, 66% of the population of, of all those 77 children had face-to-face -face contact um, um, with uh, their birth family, either with one parent or both parents or with their siblings. Those were mostly um, those in foster care and kinship care. 
um, um, adopt, uh, adopt, adopted kids seem to have much more post box or indirect contact, um, as it's to be expected, I suppose. Um, in terms of the children's reactions to contact, um, according to their parents, children had different reactions, and it, that didn't seem to depend a lot on, uh, on the placement. Um, the reactions also change with time. Um, so when the when the children were younger, um, parents uh, and carers tended to to report more. Um, negative effects or the children came back from contact upset or frightened or um, um, they didn't want to go, etc. Um, but um, the situations in general had improved either as a result of modifying contact arrangements, for example, contact being uh, going from unsupervised to supervised or going into a family center um, uh, instead of, uh, you know, Different, different arrangements being modified and kind of listening to what the children wanted or stopping contact altogether, or the child being able to understand the purpose of contact, contact and being settled in the placement, all that helped. Um, um, children, um, parents and carers also talk, um, explain how children had to co cope uh, with a range of um, they learn cope with a range of things like sad memories and painful stories, feelings of abandonment, uh, their parents' mental illness, and family history of domestic violence, uh, offending, alcohol, and substance abuse. Even the children talk a bit about that, about how they wish their parents to stop drinking, or you know, or how they were trying to understand their parents' mental health uh, problems, etc. Um, some children were happy with, appeared happy with the level of contact, whereas others seem to want more contact um, with, I, with, especially with their siblings. Um, in terms of family communication, um, there were we this, we found that there were different. Um, I think the parents and carers seem to display different attitudes um, in in relation to sharing information about their, the children's birth family or their past in care. Uh, whereas uh, some uh, shared all the information, uh, others didn't, uh, didn't take that view and were actively concealing certain facts that they deemed potentially distressing or um, that the children were, wouldn't be able to understand due to their age or their, their um, Characteristics, um, and that that was especially adopted parents, but there were others as well. Um, and even now, birth parent um, felt that um, birth parent told us that the the child actually had no memory of uh, being being into care uh, or going into care. Uh, then other other uh, parents and carers felt. Um, felt very difficult to communicate, you know, um, that sort of information to the children and some gave a simplified or romanticized version of the past uh, of the world family because of the difficulties of, of having to explain, you know, a, a abandonment and other issues was, was a bit, was very complicated. Um, in terms of attitudes, they they felt um, children had also different attitudes towards asking those type of or talking about these type of issues. So, whereas some asked questions and talked about the birth family um, often enough, uh, others were deep in the past but were not asking them, and others. Um, Never, never asked anything or talked about the birth family because already knew everything, had forgotten, or were, or, or were not interested, uh, were not interested according to their uh, parents or carers. However, we found as well that whereas some um, some parents 
believe that their child was not interested or was not talking about the, those issues. Um, actually, when we, you talk to the child, the child was telling they would like to know more, and the parents weren't aware of this. So they were. It was interesting to see different, um, you know, how the how the um, parents and, and children had different views on that. Um, can I just ask, is yeah. there any cross-referencing between the children who did receive explanations? Um, you know, just wondering if there any similarities that were coming across for children who were being told nothing and some yes. of the behavioural outcomes? And yeah, um, actually, we because we, we, have, we don't really have, I don't think there would be a very significant significant because of we didn't have very big numbers but it would be an interesting thing to explore maybe further because yeah. um, we didn't really look into that but that would be that would be yeah, yeah. interesting to look at um, so in terms of social service involvement um, now birth parents were obviously the ones that had had more they had been more involved with social services, but we also, they were also the most critical of the support provided by social services, and they talked about feeling marginalized and the man uh, distrusted by social services compared to other other groups. Um, um, adoptive parents, in contrast, they had the least, you know, amount of involvement in social services, and uh, although some were happy with that, some advocated for more of a continued role of social services as they felt kind of a sense of abandonment when when after after the adoption went through and they felt like um, you know they couldn't really ask for help to anybody. So that was that was a bit the same with uh, residents or the carers, post residents older, and they felt that the, it would be nice to have, like, uh, that they could call when there was a problem. Um, a few kinship carers um, experienced a sense of disregard and lack of support, and and because precisely because they were relatives, they felt that less valued and supported by social services. Um, some residents or their carers were happy that social services were no longer there or they felt the residents or the kind of enable them to kind of um, get on with their lives and live normal lives. Um, however, others were more uh, advocating more for a continued role for social services, in term, especially in terms of the provision of financial support and other support because they may have had other children who are fostered and and the ones that were subject to a residence or they didn't get the same supports and they felt like, you know, that, that kind of difference. Um, um, most kinship carers were happy with the support being provided by social services. Um, so in terms of social support, um, what we found is that the most important source of support that um, parents and carers felt they had was their families. However, uh, both parents were the ones that um, were less likely to have that type of support and they talk more about friends, but in general, both parents have the least extensive network of support in relation to both family and friends. Um, and on the, other, on the other hand, foster carers and residents or the, um, had the access to the most extensive family support networks. Um, they felt that their families were had been very involved, were being very involved in the, the lives of their children. Um, support from extended family also provided for the was also provided for the majority of adoptive parents who also fostered the child. And I'm just going to go through kind of a summary of all those findings. Um, so what we found is that placements were characterized by stability, so most of the placements had remained stable over time, um, and there wasn't much evidence of instability, but then this was when the children um, were between 9 and 14, so they were entering the teenage years, and we could see, we could see some, 
uh, placements that were more like vulnerable than others. So what happens next is critical. So we are really interested to see what's happened in those years because that was those interviews were done between 2009 and 2010. So now we will be interviewing them again in uh, 2017. Um, yeah, and we'll be interviewing them next year and um, the following year. So we'll, we'll be able to kind of piece the things together and see if this stability has remained over the children's lives or 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 it was really at that stage where placements kind of started to break down. Um, what we, what our, um, what our findings seem to suggest is that all long-term placements have the potential to nurture positive outcomes for children in terms of their attachment to parents' cares and their self-concept, you know, their self-esteem, and other issues as well that we saw in the qualitative interviews with the children. Um, the, the study also highlights the importance of speaking to both parents, carers and children because we saw that depending on who, who spoke, we got, we got different, um, different answers to our questions, although we looked at different outcomes, but still it was interesting to see, to, see, to, to have both perspectives. Um, and when we ask does placement type make a difference, well, it depends on what you are looking at and who you are talking to. So um, what the children seem to uh, tell us is that they were actually attached to their parents and they were happy irrespective of placement type. So in this sense, maybe placement type, if, if the placements are stable, it seems to not matter that much. But then, um, in other, in other ways, it, 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 there, there are differences in terms of the perceived problem behaviors and the parenting stress of their carers and, and parents. And there's also, so that was higher for foster carers and birth parents. And also there was a high level of health needs for adopted children. And in terms of education, um, there were quite some difficulties for children return home and, and other groups as well. Um, so well, that depends, as I said, on who and what you are asking whether this mental matters, providing that the stability is there. Um, so next steps now, we are, we've started this now, next phase of the study, which is called the Teens and Audience Adulthood. Um, basically, we plan to interview uh, approximately 200 of those 374 young people, and they'll be aged between 18 and 22. And we'll also talk to their parents and carers, their last, the, the last, the last carers that they had, um, you know, the long placement that they had. And we'll be visiting them twice, like we did in this phase that I've talked about it, although I didn't go into much methodology, but basically we, we asked them to complete uh, uh, a series of measures in the in the first visit, and we asked them that we asked them questions um, in a semi-structured interview in the second visit for both the parents and the children, and uh, we'll be doing the same for uh, this phase for the young people. So what we'll do this time, we'll actually use a questionnaire that will be inserted in a tab in a computer tablet for the young people and we'll do the same for the parents and carers or we'll go through them with the parents and carers more. Whereas the young people will have a bit more privacy to go over it themselves and we'll be able to answer any questions they have. Um, and then uh, in the second visit we'll, we'll be engaging in a conversation in a semi-structured interview that we will, and we will use um, the tablets again but more for more, more for um, to have some, a visual aid in front of them rather than for them to complete it in the tablet. So it will be like a conversation. Um, and we'll be talking to their parents and carers as well. So we'll be, we, we'll be um, looking at similar stuff from the, that phase, the children's perspective, but we'll be also adding other issues that because they are older 
um, they are more appropriate for their age. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll be looking at attachment again and, uh, and self-concept. We'll also be looking at other things like um, you know, lifestyle and uh, um, sense. Um, sense of belonging and you know, like their experience of, of care, you know, their overall experience um, and social support and stress as well. We to. Um, so it'll be a, a lot of diff it'll be different, but it'll be it'll be a continuation of the study so to see how how we've changed in time as well. So that's that's me on. Um, so uh, here's a couple of uh, publications we have. We also have a blog where um, we disseminate a bit of our findings of, uh, of that phase as well. Um, so, so thank you. Hope it works okay. <laughs> Yeah. <clears throat>